Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Forward Thinking. Um, I am thrilled today to be joined by Nick Adams, who is the founder of Public Editor, uh, Tagworks, and a whole bunch of other things. One of the themes that came up last year in Forward 50 was the concept of resilient democracy. And uh, if you're reading any kind of news today, you know that democracy itself is kind of in this epistemic crisis because we don't have a shared context. And in the past, there was like a professional class of experts we trusted to give us facts. But today, everybody is an expert and they're able to publish on a level playing field that's gone from expensive broadcast one-to-many communications to cheap one-to-one, -one, any-to-any communications. This obviously presents a tremendous number of challenges for anybody trying to deal with getting the facts straight and uh, understanding the nature of information, which is necessary for functioning societies. So please join me in welcoming Nick Adams. Hey, Nick. Hey, thanks for having me, Alistair. Uh, so I have a lot of questions for you. Uh, digging a bit into your background, uh, I noticed that you said you started in politics uh, running electoral campaigns and then changed your mind and decided you could do better work in other ways. Was there a thing that made you go, okay, I'm done running elections and campaigns and I want to focus on information? Yeah. So uh, I started getting my PhD in sociology at Berkeley and what motivated me to go get further education on society and sociology was the, that I thought I, I might become a politician myself. Um, but uh, as I was learning more about how society works, uh, I realized that technology was actually the biggest agent of change in society. So it could be um, agricultural technology or um, industrial technology. In our information age, it's all this incredible information and social networking technology. Um, and I think a, a really good example of that is something like Facebook, which in about 10 years, uh, collected as many users uh, who were spending about as much time as uh, like the whole Chinese government or all of Islam. Um, these with religions and massive civilizations that took hundreds or thousands of years to build up a big following. Facebook did it in 10 years because the technology is so accessible uh, and so easily connects people. So, so yeah, I just, I, I realized that the biggest impact would, I could possibly make would be in technology. So um, you did some work around Occupy. Uh, can you tell me what it means to try and make sense of that much unstructured stuff? And what were the problems you saw when trying to understand what was going on with the Occupy movement? Sure, yeah. Um, so the Occupy movement, as some people probably know, uh, featured 184 different little movements across US cities and towns. Um, and that actually creates a really good situation for what we scientists would call a natural experiment. Uh, there's enough of a very similar phenomenon happening, happening in a bunch of different places that however things play out differently probably reflects more on those different places and reflects more on the city government and the police departments in those places than it does on the movement itself. So I wanted to understand that and understand it very well. Um, if I could wave a magic wand, I would have showed up at every single event across all of those 184 different movements. Um, but the next best thing is to have a bunch of journalists showing up at all of those events and reporting on them. So um, I, I was teaching so social science methods at the time, and I kind of skimmed the top Berkeley students in social science methods, pulled them into a team, and we went out and collected all of the news articles, um, including radio and television news, from all of these places that were reporting on their local Occupy movements. And this is just a massive amount of information, um, almost 10,000 news articles that include all the information about what the city's doing, what the police are doing, what the protesters are doing in particular events, um, in events that are in series, which we call campaigns, uh, and also what was going on at those encampments. So we were completely flooded and inundated with all this information. Um, and then the next step was to apply our analytical procedures, which is really just the theories of protest movements and police and protester interactions from the literature, we wanted to apply those theories to the documents themselves, find the information that was relevant for those theories, extract it, put it into a database so that we could start doing these like multi-level time series models to understand these intricate webs of interaction from strategic levels down to like the tactical level on the ground. Um, and extracting that information from the text, organizing it, getting it into a database where, where we could do statistical analysis, 
was, was a huge job and there just weren't tools out there to make that possible when they got started. It does seem like uh, we aren't very good as democratic societies at listening at scale. Uh, I was reading something recently on, on the Great Depression and how the first couple of years of reaction to the Great Depression didn't go very well because they didn't really have the instrumentation, the sort of sensing apparatus to understand what was working and what wasn't working. And as a result, the U.S. rolled out um, everything from, you know, these various economic analysis books like the Beige Book and stuff to the, improving the census and emboldening that stuff. And that was great in this sort of atomic world where uh, the sources of information were relatively scarce. But it does feel like we are in a world now where that sense making apparatus is kind of broken um, because we have so many possible sources of information. And there's so much mistrust for the default ones. Um do you right. think that we do you think a democracy itself is going to have to change to catch up with this shift from one to many to many to many sort of broadcast to multicast dynamics of information? Yeah, absolutely. And and you're kind of saying at the top of the conversation um in the in the nineties and in the aughts, we all felt like, wow, this is great. We can all communicate to everyone in the world. Um, if I want to be the the maven of this or the expert of that, I can I can plausibly make it happen. I can get my ideas out there, um, and that is a good thing. There's a lot of voices that were probably unheard for a long time that that are now uh, in a position to be heard. So that's positive. But uh, our our ability to edit, our ability to yeah, to really kind of edit this information, contextualize it, um, curate it, has not scaled. We, we've not scaled any of that yet, or we're working on it now. Um, and so it means there's just this kind of morass of information. And once you once we also pair that with kind of um, inequality that is causing a lot of people to lose trust in established elites, we end up with a situation where we don't we don't even trust the old gatekeepers anymore. Um, and not that those old gatekeepers were even able to scale up to the job of kind of editing and curating and um, commenting on all of the stuff that's now being put out. So uh, we're seeing in the news today the battle between, for example, Facebook and Australia. Um, right. And there's an old line that, you know, the truth is behind a paywall, but the lies are free. Yeah. Um, and now we also have this world where you know, the, the community on Facebook chooses what to amplify across news and doesn't necessarily pass that money back to the reporters. So um, what do you think is going to, like, there's an asymmetric threat here. If I want to attack information, I can attack it, especially with the advent of technologies like GPT-3, far more easily than information can defend itself. True. How do we fix that asymmetry? Yeah, well, uh, we're working on that with our public editor project here at the Goodly Labs. Um, you're reminding me of a cute little bit of marketing that we didn't push out too much, but uh, there's the there, there's the quote that, that's misattributed to Mark Twain that says, um, a lie can get halfway around the world while the truth is still lacing up its shoes. And we had this cute little bit of marketing that says, uh, with public editor, the truth just got Velcro. <laughs> um, but... <laughs> Uh, sorry, that's a, probably a little too uh, self uh, self entertaining. Um, what we're doing with Public Editor, we, we've we've now created a tool. It's kind of a, a social epistemology tool, um, if you will. But it's it's a way for people collectively to um, evaluate and find and label different kinds of misinformation that are appearing in news articles. Right now, we're working with news articles, but this is a system. Uh, that we're already showing can scale. We're in the midst of a demonstration project right now showing how it scales up. Um, and it can certainly work for easier content like Facebook posts and Twitter posts, which, which tend to be shorter and more focused. Um, but what we're doing right now, and, and maybe I can show you in a minute, is we make it possible now for a newsreader to read through an article. And as they're reading, there are labels over all of the words, the particular words and phrases that are committing some kind of logical fallacy or some kind of inferential mistake or cognitive bias is showing up in those particular words. So a label will show up saying, you know, this is a this is posing a false dilemma. This is confirmation bias, et cetera. Um, and what that does over time is it it actually trains the newsreader to be a little bit more discerning as they're reading. Um, but it also is a, a scalable solution 
so that you know, not every single person in the world has to become an expert in media literacy, an expert in critical thinking in order to use the internet and get the valuable information out of it while avoiding um, the, the traps and the, and the faulty information that can lead them astray. So I'm, I'm a big fan of game theory and incentives as a way of uh, extracting information uh, or regulation. Um, it, how do you avoid this being like preaching to the choir where people who are attracted to a system for critical thinking are themselves people who like critical thinking? Setting aside for a moment yeah. the fact that the people who are most likely to commit cognitive biases are the ones that think they're smart. Um, how do you get everybody to do this? Like, is there a model where you have to read, you have to read five articles in order to read five more? Like, how do you get society to realize the value of veracity? Yeah, I think, I think this is, this is a real concern of ours. It's been a concern for, since the beginning. Um, and I think we might have some trouble reaching the very far out extremes. There are some people who are just, they're in the game to to put out misinformation and to ingest it uh, i have to admit that at one point i derived some pleasure some entertainment from watching flat earth videos on youtube i have never believed there's a flat earth but the videos are quite entertaining so there's going to be some of that there's going to be some people on the extremes that we won't reach um, but if we borrow from thinkers like uh eric Fromm and his in his great work um the the escape from freedom the What's probably going on with these conspiracy theories is that people are looking for a place to belong. They're, they're looking for a place, you know, epistemically, ideologically, socially to belong. Um, and if they are disaffected by established elites and the, the media, the mainstream media, then they can go to these places and they feel like they belong and they have an understanding of the world, maybe a secret understanding of the world, a secret and superior understanding of the world. Um, but it's really about wanting to feel like they belong and that their individuality makes sense in, in society. So with Public Editor itself, you know, we are cultivating a community of people who do the little tasks. These tasks are distributed across an assembly line, so they're, they're pretty easy tasks that people can, can get up to speed doing. Um, but we're doing our best to facilitate and foster community among these folks. So people start to take on the, into their identity the idea that I'm going to help my democracy, my society share reality again. Um, so I think that's one aspect of how we get people to care about it. It's not we we, we agree that we're probably not going to get millions and millions of people to do it for the sake of nerdery or something like that. There needs to be a higher ideal like sharing reality. Well, and I think people um, if people start to see it as their civic duty to maintain yeah. information like that. But again, you get to the the problems, I read a hilarious, uh, this is a marketing prank, but it's a pretty interesting, do you know what the birds aren't real movement? I've seen that. Yeah, it's, so this is like a guy who decided he would start a movement saying birds aren't real. Forget the flat earth. You can go buy a chicken and take it apart at home and see it's not a robot, but apparently chickens are exempt. But he's got this whole thing that like pigeons are actually mechanical government drones. Yes. And like people are buying his merch and some people are kind of getting into it and going, hmm, it seems like even things we can objectively verify with a trip to the supermarket yeah. are so much fun to talk about that we yes. are willing to participate in this collective illusion or delusion. Yeah. Uh, Dan Hahn and his brother have talked about, you know, QAnon being an, all, uh, an ARG. Um, that's a lot more fun than proofreading articles. It's, it, it is fun. I mean, I've seen those, these memes and I think, I think they're really fun too. Um, but at the end of the day, like if you if you get into the news, if you're a, an avid news reader, I don't know if you've had the experience I've had, but I bet a lot of people have had the experience of, of just getting the sense over time, over the last few years, um, as a result of kind of the buzzfeedification of the media, where everything has to be grabbing attention in order to, to actually be written, even in the New York Times. Um, when you after the buzzfeedification of the media, I've gotten to a point where I barely want to read the news anymore because I feel like I'm always being kind of duped. And so it, our our project really is around the mission of getting people to share reality. It's around the mission of gradually raising the bar of journalism, the, the, the bar of quality, the standard of quality, gradually raising that back up to where it was, you know, at least a few decades ago, if not. Back. You think that the, the, I mean, it, it seems to me like 
this has to be a function of the platform. And we've seen cases where in Twitter you can report things or Facebook, you know, can flag certain yes. things and mention provenance. Um, but it, it also seems like this is a thing that like people pay to read the Financial Times knowing that they're paying for truth. Exactly. Uh, for example, right? And that the, the brand of truth becomes a sustainable competitive advantage or a competitive moat for certain um, certain publications, but only if we as a society start to value that over, you know, a cool name or a listicle that they publish or whatever. Exactly. And um, if you're familiar with Section 230, which, you know, some people call it the 26 words that create the internet, there's actually a, quite a bit more than 26 words. And um, some of the words talk about, uh, you know, it being the, the policy of the U.S. government to encourage these third party platforms, your Facebooks and Twitters of the world. Um, to to cooperate with third party filters that filter out, uh, you know, egregious content. Um, and we think that a, as we get going here, uh, Facebook and Twitter should be making it really easy for their users to include public editor uh, quality. Uh, oh, like like a Chrome plugin, but for Facebook. Yeah, exactly. So there should be a plugin that said so that a user can say, I don't want to see any news in my Facebook feed unless it scores at least an 80 out of 100 on public editor. Right. Uh, that would be pretty easy to do, actually. But, but then a lot of people would say, OK, at what point do you make it mandatory? Right. Like like uh, I was on a clubhouse the other day and yeah. one of the people's profiles, like everyone else's profile was normal. And then one of the people said there was a button that said report for trolling. It yeah. wasn't anyone else's. And I'm like, I wonder if this person has been accused of trolling in the past. So now mm -hmm. there's an option saying, so you could say like, if the article doesn't get above, above a certain amount, you know, block this or report this for being fake, where if it has been well verified, you don't get as easy or visible an option to do that. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not one for, for really super strong regulation or censorship. Um, if that happened, if the government came in and said everyone has to use public editor, I, I guess I'd be happy with it. I probably wouldn't fight them on it. Um, but I, I don't I don't think that's quite the way we it's certainly not necessary. Uh, there, there's a technological architecture here that would make it really easy for Facebook and Twitter to supply us with an API that would make it possible for their users to do this voluntarily. So we're talking about abstracts. Can you give me a sense of what it looks like? Can you maybe bring up a screen or something and show us? Sure. Yeah, let me. Um, let me share my screen here. And the other thing I didn't I didn't quite mention, Alistair, I think it's really really right to, to be thinking about people's motivations when they're when there's they're doing these tasks, these annotation tasks. And we've actually done some work to gamify the system, and we're we're improving our gamification. But even now, people can earn badges, um, and eventually they can earn certifications that. It could actually be quite possible, quite uh, valuable. If somebody becomes expert in the eight different tasks uh, across our assembly line, they actually are building up a great amount of critical thinking ability, which, as we know, is more and more valuable the more crap is out there on the internet. <laughs> um, but I think everyone can see my screen now. Is that right? Uh, yeah, I can see it. OK, so what we're showing you is, is kind of a, a news feed of the future where um, you're seeing the headline in the first few sentences of the article, but you also see these credibility hallmarks out to the right. And we end up grading these articles just on a zero to 100 system, like most people are familiar with. And if I click into one of these articles, um, now I'm looking at the article and as I read it, if I'm a news reader and I hover over something, I can see you know, um, one point is deducted here because we've got an unhelpful metaphor. Uh, two points are added to the article score because we have a good qualified source being quoted. Um, there's some problems here where the reasoning of this particular clause is begging the question. It's appealing to ignorance. Um, we scroll down here. We have a qualified source, but they have inappropriate confidence. They have some hindsight bias. There's lots of different problems in here. And th these labels are generated not by someone going through and just taking notes on what they think they see because you know they believe they are the master critic. Um, they're, they're generated through a process where people are walking through a protocol and they could be checking for 
um, re different reasoning fallacies. They could be walking through a different protocol that's checking through to make sure that the evidence is uh, properly supporting the claim. And we go into pretty scientific, uh, scientifically rigorous evaluations of evidence. So we're looking at whether things um, meet Hill's criteria to satisfy causation instead of just correlation. We're looking at whether there's systematic uncertainty or statistical uncertainty in a study if it's reporting statistics. We, we really kind of dig in there. Um, and then we're reporting labeling over 40 different types of, of these mistakes on the article uh, itself. So um, if we're starting to see, as you said, you know, Facebook is able to, in a matter of a decade, acquire as many citizens, if you will, as many of the world's biggest countries or most populous religions. Um, do you think we're going to get to a point where a social network becomes a sovereign system? Like there's no, I live in Canada. Yeah. There's no Canadian government social network. And we seem to be fine with the government building highways. We're less fine with the government building broadband. We haven't really talked about the government building a social network and it's yeah. unlikely anyone would. Like, I don't really want to go hang out on the government run version of Twitter, but right. at the same time, there could be a future in which that's considered a public resource. And like, that's where you go to hear what your politicians have been up to or uh, have conversations that are considered accountable and so on. Um, do you think countries are going to develop their own national social networks? I think it's plausible. There was actually a moment a few years back when someone from the State Department uh, contacted me to to discuss that sort of possibility. Um, I do think there's a role for these uh, interactive service providers, as they're called under Section 230, to be treated more and more like utilities. Um, and, I, and I think that would actually be totally appropriate. We do see situations, I think, um, and let me just not name any particular corporation at this point, because I, I can't stand up to their PR department. Um, but we, I think we see situations where some of these corporations um, could very well uh, make it easier for a small startup or, or a small business to, to work with them. And instead they end up um, engaging in practices to kind of steal whatever good idea was there or incorporate it into the platform, which is precisely not what a utility should be doing. Um, but I, yeah, I, I, I remember, I remember having a conversation with Jonathan Zittrain years ago Yeah. Um, at like web two summit in San Francisco, I think. And we were talking about um, the common carrier laws. And, and I think people misunderstand that the history of the communications acts were like, if I kidnapped someone in California and brought them to Colorado, and then I delivered the ransom call over AT&T's phone lines, at and is not liable for what I communicated, even though I've committed right. this crime because they're not discriminating traffic, right? And this was the whole idea of bandwidth neutrality is like, if I'm bandwidth neutral, then I don't care what's in the packet, so I can't be liable. And there's good precedent for this in the difference between like Prodigy and CompuServe, where one claimed to be curating content and the other one said it's a free for all, and that affected their legal liability. And so mm -hmm. there's this weird idea that if you curate and claim that your data is good, then you're liable for it because you've you've said it's good. Um, but that seems to impact you know the implementation of editorial stuff. But at the same time. Nobody would argue that they're not um, curating things because there's an algorithm choosing what's in your feed. So doesn't that sort of circumvent the intent of the of the of Section 230? Well, I think this is where the the other part of the U.S. policy that I mentioned should actually be getting a huge boost. Um, to, to use the analogy, if Facebook is the water company, they should absolutely be able to run water lines to our houses. Um, but they shouldn't be able to print, prevent me as a user from putting another filter on the water pump at my sink. With Public Editor, we want to provide an additional filter. Yeah, this was, I remember there was a time in the early days of AT&T or mid midlife of AT&T. I remember Steve Wozniak freaking out because he wanted to open up a joke line and, you know, charge, you'd call this number and you'd hear a joke and you'd pay some money. And it was going to cost them like a thousand bucks a month to rent the answering machine from AT&T because they prevented you from plugging anything else into the phone line that wasn't AT&T certified, you'd be fined for doing so. And yeah. so it does seem like um, there's that old article about the death of the web that was on Wired like 15 years ago. But I, you know, the fact that that the apps I use can control whether I can view source. Uh, and if you go and right click on a web page, you know, there's a lot of obfuscation. It's incredibly hard to find that image or video 
Um, you know, in some cases you can't do screen captures of it. So this does seem like it comes down to a, an argument about open source and, you know, the right to root and the right to get to the source code, which many of those companies would argue, at least when you're running the app, uh, is a is a trade secret or proprietary. So there's no way for me to install a plugin on top of Facebook. Uh, there is with Chrome and certain other open source projects. So, right. Uh, it, it, do you think extensibility, like requiring extensibility by the law, is a way to move us towards a world where we can have these sort of epistemic correction systems? That, that that's exactly what I think, and it's it's right there in Section 230 that that sort of filtering it is supposed to be encouraged by U.S. policy. Um, so if Australia had said, instead of saying, you know, hey, bad stuff, if Australia had said, Facebook, in order for you to be here, you have to make the, make a plugin ecosystem in the next year or so that will allow people to create stuff that will um, filter or like the water filter, if you will. Yeah. Um, we, we think your water's toxic or yeah. whatever the Australians may think, or it's bad for trade or or whatever. And as a result, we will make it so that people can impl can implement their own filters on side of it and get some agency on the on the client side. I I think so. I think this is a this would be a win for Facebook. It'd be a win for the Australian government, and it would be a win for the whole um, you know nascent industry of what I call credibility service providers. Um, we are an organization that provides credibility for the web. Um, I've never heard credibility as a service, but. Uh, and I like that it's it's also crass, which is kind of nice. Um, <laughs> but that's I'd never heard of that term before, uh, and it, it seems like in the last year I, I've heard of like, term. Yeah. <laughs> Paulus Kialo, uh, the work that Jamie Joyce, who we've chatted with before, uh, is doing. It seems like there's a rise of many of these different organizations that are trying to provide some kind of create uh, credibility, whether that's understanding the ontology of an argument or pruning it down, uh, or giving people a, a user interface to sort of annotate and, and and vote and rank things or the work that you're doing, obviously. And I think what they're doing is great. Um, I'm going to borrow an analogy. Uh, what, you know, when Google wanted to help people be able to move around in their cities, or I should say Waze, the Waze app, wanted people to move around the cities, they didn't try to train every single person um, you know, to memorize the map of the city. They, they gave them an app so they can use it in real time. Um, and Kialo and what Jamie's doing is, is really excellent. In some ways, that's like, uh, we're gonna build a community map and this will be the, the map of kind of the, the discursive reality of our society. Um, and actually, I, I love what they're doing and we have some similar projects that we, I think we're just gonna roll into the stuff that they're doing. But with Public Editor, it's, it's more like that Google map or that Waze map, where when you're in the moment of reading what could be garbage on the internet, you're going to have what you need layered over that information to make sure you understand it um, and understand it. And it also seems like, you know, if, if 50 yet the other day I was driving somewhere and Google told me to go straight and I couldn't, it was a one way street because it was under construction. Right. There's a signal there. If enough people ignore that direction and turn left, you can write a thing that says, Hey, go check if that street has been closed. Right. In the same way you can use weak signals. If this system is pervasive, to identify that someone should go in and investigate this and, 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 you know, more like a Wikipedia edit where, where enough people flag something, then a, m a more senior Wikipedia person comes in and, you know, writes a Snopes article or whatever else. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I love any comparison to Wikipedia because, uh, you know, when Wikipedia started, everyone kind of felt like, oh, that's not going to work. People aren't going to do that. People aren't that altruistic. Um, or it, anything that's on there is going to be super biased because people are just going to go. Well, I remember the original plan was to have like a thousand people. They were going to pay to edit it, right? Yeah. Yeah. But but there's enough of us. Um, so, someone gave me a lot of hope. They said one of, one of the fundamental motivations of human beings is to correct people when they're wrong. <laughs> well, I mean, that's how we evolved to be. You know, we evolved to get the approval of our peers. Right. And certainly that means getting being right. But as Jonathan Haidt says, don't worry about being correct because that's not what we optimize for. We mm -hmm. optimize for the approval of our tribe. And yeah. so we come back to the same problem here where if you have, you know, anti-vax versus fax or flat earth versus, I can't believe I say spherical earth, um, but maybe it's because I've been on a lot of airplanes. Uh, it seems to me like you still have this problem of activating the normal middle that society is yeah. not a bell curve. It's this well curve with incredibly loud voices and engagement on either side. 
And yeah. until the middle sort of goes, wait a minute, it's my job to keep this democracy functioning by making sure we're all dealing with consistent information. It feels like we need to wake up the middle or we need to make it a law in the same way that the Australia passes mandatory voting, for example. We can make laws that say that this stuff has to be in place, but then you get a lot of concern about the nanny state and you get the rise of parlor and other platforms that say we're absolutely not going to do this. How do you see that playing out? Well, you know, I, I'm pretty hopeful that there are enough people out there to to kind of keep this thing going. It, it actually doesn't take a ton of people. Um, so what we do, we take in articles, we take in the most shared viral articles on the internet. Um, that's There's another third party that kind of measures that. And if you think about the average newsreader, even an avid newsreader is probably only going to read, what, 30 articles a day, maybe. So we think if we could do the top 100 most shared articles across, most shared across Facebook and Twitter, if we could do that every day, um, we would be making a huge impact. And that doesn't really require that many people. That requires uh, 3,000 people spending 15 minutes a day. Um, and you know, I think it comes out, if we were to pay everyone $15 an hour, it comes out to somewhere around $6 million a year. It also seems like you could tell people, look, um, you know, the following newspapers have agreed to give you access behind a paywall as long as you review 30 articles a month. And you have yep. like a an army of reviewers that are incented to do so because that way the, the newspaper or publication gets to put a badge on saying this has been publicly edited. From, from your mouth to the news publisher's ears. Well, hopefully. Um, so uh, you've obviously analyzed a tremendous number of interesting things. Uh, what was the most unexpected thing you learned from the analysis of Occupy? Ah, wow, that's a great one. Um, and let me dig back into that because it's, uh, it's a project that has been a little bit on the back. Um, well, what, one thing we found that was really interesting is that uh, that there were cities, and Atlanta is a great example, um, there, in cities that kind of had violent crime waves um, prior to the Occupy movement, they were just incredibly like sla lax about the movement. Um, and cities that didn't have a bunch of crime, I think took a lot more, put a lot more focus and attention on the movement. So that was pretty interesting. You, you can kind of you can kind of see the the chiefs and the lieutenants saying like, yeah, it's a bunch of kids in the park. We've got like serious problems in these other in these other places in the city. But that was really interesting. Um, also, departments that had less budget per capita really seemed to try to nip the movement in the bud um, and really try to show force early and get them evicted early. Uh, whereas departments that had a little more cash on hand could kind of afford to see how it played out over the course of several weeks and just do some more gentle surveillance. Have you um, done any analysis on like the BLM movement or, or other movements since then? Uh, what we're doing right now is actually extending and deepening our analysis of those Occupy movement cases. Um, we've kind of done, uh, we've analyzed kind of the top layer of the data, but once we get into the, the intricacies of the blow by blow tactical interactions, um, we're expecting to find sequences of interaction that often lead to violence and probably some decision points. So we use some hierarchical, um, well, we're using like hidden Markov models actually to see how these sequences play out and see if we can identify these decision points where it's a very clear decision by the police or by the protesters' strategists will lead to violence or, or something more like a combination. Can, so can you explain a hidden Markov that. model to the uninitiated? Yeah, um, sort of. Let me let me do it quickly. I don't I, I don't know if I can do it quickly enough to do it justice um, or in depth enough to do it justice. Um, but what you're looking at is a sequence of things that happen. And you're basically positing that there's some unknown variable that's causing them. That's also kind of in this parallel sequence. And as you kind of move through the sequences, you're testing whether that that unknown variable prior to the uh, event is important or not, um, and and maybe like what how much of an effect it has on the next step. So then you can kind of isolate, you know, if there's four things that happen in a sequence, were the first three like stacked in a way that they were going to happen together no matter what, 
or the first two stack together in a way that are going to happen no matter what? Or is there some decision point in between? So it's it so, sounds like you're trying to extract causality versus correlation. Yeah, it's about it's about finding the the causal moments where um, human decisions can actually make a big difference in the outcomes. So I'm a huge fan of Isaac Asimov, and the Foundation series is basically you know data science porn in some ways. It's like, <laughs> hey, we're going to use we can't get humans to behave well. We know there's going to be a collapse of civilization for millennia. How do we weather the collapse? Huge mm -hmm. spoiler, by the way. Um, how do we weather the collapse so it's a thousand years and you know society ending, not ten thousand years and species ending? Mm, yeah. Uh, it feels like we're in one of those inflection points now, where <clears throat> you know we we have to figure out how to organize ourselves as a society for the greatest good for the most people in an era of digital. And that could go anywhere. I mean, it could be that whoever's in charge is the person with the most, most followers this week, which is a pretty scary future. But, it, you know, we used to be a monarchy a few hundred years ago, and that was the way it was. Uh, what do you think is going to, what's the new, and this is a big bet to make, what do you think is going to be the new sort of equilibrium for, for democracy based on shared information? Oh, okay. Wow, you could have given this, me this question ahead of time. Alex. No, it's much more fun to think about it on the fly. <laughs> um, no, I do. I do see our time as a big inflection point, point. Um, and I, I guess I'm uh, an optimist just by my nature. So I, and, and you know, with all the work that we're doing, we're we're trying to make sure <laughs> that things end up well. So what I see happening, um, I look at our current. Uh, democratic uh, and electoral uh, governance system. And I see a system that was built in the 18th century and it was optimized for the Pony Express. Um, you needed, that was the communication system and you needed to have the representatives all in one place so that they could deliberate. Um, yeah, if nothing not else, the Pony Pony has been a, a lesson in civics and things like electoral slates and colleges and yeah. so on, right? Yeah, um, but all of that is very old technology. So it, like my vision of the future is that we obviate all of this dysfunctional technology. We make it obsolete. Um, we can do online deliberation and we can federate it from the level of like your neighborhood or even smaller, some organization to a neighborhood, to a town, to a city, to a region, to the nation, to the world. Um, and and we can use deliberative technology to make decisions together and, and get people to have some skin in the game of deciding what their reality is going to be. I see a world with plenty of resources, plenty. Um, and especially as we shift to uh, cleaner, more renewable energy and the cost of energy comes down, uh, I, I think, you know, it, I, I, if we screw this up, <laughs> It's, it's a huge tragedy, not just in terms of human lives, lives lost, but just in, in terms, if you're able to have like the, the big view of the cosmic view, the difference between where, the delta between where we could be and where we are right now is completely massive. And if we make our situation even worse because we're just holding on to um, some old institutional routines that were built mostly in Europe, always with this idea of like power going up to one person, usually one man, who's fighting with other men of the same amount of power. Um, that whole regime of power is completely obsolete and very destructive. And I see us right now in this kind of neo-feudalism where we have these, you know, these, especially once, once our billionaires start deciding they should be popular. I like Elon Musk, but it's a little scary to me that he has that much money and he likes to tweet. And he's going to build a colony on Mars. Oh, and also he he's, he's he's separating himself from um, fiat currencies that might control him. So if he wants to live in space independently, like that's literally the plot of uh, the first William Gibson book, right? Like, yeah. There's and, a space station within a sentient AI. And, and in a more dystopian time, if I were an AI and I wanted to fuel my computing bills and not tell anyone, I would make YouTube videos and get clicks and, and convert that to Bitcoin, right? And yeah, use that totally. to pay for my compute work. And, and I just don't, I don't see him in particular uh, doing a lot to try to make the world better for a larger set of people. 
Um, the Expanse is a pretty good documentary yeah. for what happens when capitalism colonizes the solar system, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, we got to wrap up, but I have a couple quick questions. Uh, and I, I think your point about the change is really interesting. If you look at evolutionary history, we see punctuated evolution, right? We see small gradual adaptation and then under conditions of huge duress, very rapid change in the fossil yeah. record. Yeah. Uh, whether you're talking about the Burgess Shale or you're talking about, you know, Martin Luther hammering something to a wall with the printing press, historians look back and they see these moments of punctuated evolution. It feels like we're in the middle of that punctuated evolution. But let's assume that what you say is right and that the government is going to have to change itself. The government's therefore the digital part of the government is going to have to create these sort of sense making platforms. So we have the nature of truth. How do we make that nonpartisan? Because the forward 50 audience is very much neither left nor right, but forward. And yeah. these are civil servants, public servants who've devoted themselves to being nonpartisan, despite the, the regime change of a particular political party affiliation. Right. And so, you know, I've never seen someone build code that doesn't have opinions. Mm. How do we make sure that the platform is nonpartisan when it's designed by, if you look at the population of Washington, D.C., very largely democratic and progressive people? How do you make sure that you build this stuff in a nonpartisan way so that you don't build bias into government at the level of information? I'm not, I'm not sure I would assume that it's going to be the governments that build the new governance technology. Um, the, the prototypes that we're seeing coming together, and you've already mentioned a few of them, are, are not being built first by governments. Um, and uh, what, I, what I anticipate happening is that, you know, if I, were, if I were running this show of what the next governance technology is going to be, it would start with stuff that would work in our smaller groups and in our organizations. And then we would show that it scales to a town. We would show that it scales to a city. And over time, everyone would start using this governance technology for everything from deciding where to eat to deciding like how rent is going to be paid by different people in a house to you know making housing policy for a city and when it, it shows itself to be effective repeatedly um, then the transition into using that at a national scale looks more like um, you have a, a political party or maybe a political team, maybe you just get away from the words party. And it's people who are dedicated to using this distributed governance technology to respond to the highest priorities of the community that's using it. That's, that's, it. that's a fascinating statement because I've heard people say civic tech is for experimenting. And then when you hand it to government, it's got to scale. But what you're saying is civic tech is actually for subverting the status quo of the way that government works today, which is I don't think I've talked to people who describe civic tech as subversive, but there's definitely I, I'm, argument I'm, I'm rather annoyed by all the civic tech out there that's like, this is so that the government can present people with one or two options and then they can fight and whoever has 50% plus one wins the day. That sort of adversarial fight your way for policy, I think is just completely wrongheaded and it's a vestige of this European war of all against all um, that, that happened, you know, for the last several hundred years. And so that it sounds like we're back to where we started and that's why you decided not to run further in politics and instead try to fix the underlying systems. It, in the future that I want to live in, there actually isn't politics. We're doing policy making. We go straight to the policy making. Po politics, um, in my definition, is it's the process whereby we decide who has control over decision making. And I would like to say, we don't have that process anymore. We don't need to spend time deciding who has control over decision making. Anyone can get into this platform that's, you know, not ultimately hierarchical, and they can put in their ideas, and we can develop policy to together that's going to work for us. Well, that sounds like a pretty aspirational uh, goal, but a good one. Uh, so I should mention also, you're going to be joining us at 4:50 in November to get into this in a little more detail, and I'm sure by then uh, you'll have some more stories for us about how it's playing out and so on. Yeah. Um, but yeah, where, what's the best way for people to find out more about this if they want to? Um, if you're, if you're interested in, uh, in kind of the broader vision that we've been talking about, you should, you should, uh, pressure me to write it all down. Um, but if you're interested in the projects that we're working on right now, uh, check out goodlylabs.org. Uh, the mission of the Goodly Labs is to empower people with tools that allow them to find common ground and build a better society. And we've got multiple different projects, uh, to help folks from 
their personal relationships to the media situation, to what's going on with protest, um, to how you can surveil your own elected officials. And, and we've got stuff on this deliberation um, sitting on the back burner. So goodlylabs.org um, is a place where this is all coming together. Amazing. And uh, yeah, thanks so much for spending some time with us today. I'm glad we got a chance to see what you're up to. Uh, given that our tagline is use technology to make society better for all, I think we're pretty closely aligned in some of these aspirations. Absolutely. Uh, can't wait to hear what you have to tell us in uh, November with the event itself. Uh, but thank you so much for spending some time uh, talking about this. I'm sure we'll be in touch again soon. It was my pleasure. Look, looking forward to November. Thanks, Alistair. See you next.